best on your radio dial. Hear the greatest sounds by far. Join the swing to the top and the 930 stop. For the swinging sounds of three. They were swinging sounds, the big sound of the greater 3UZ at the top of Burke Street. It was a radio station that most of us who were aspiring to get into radio yearned and wanted to work at. Uh, a man that was part of the, uh, the big days at the greater, Bob Cornish, good evening to you. G'day, fellas. G'day, Bruce. Nice to hear from you, Philip. Oh, great to have you on the show. We've been looking forward to this date, Bob. That's a pleasure. What made 3UZ the greater in your days, Bob? Oh, I think 3UZ went through a whole series of eras, uh, Bruce, quite frankly. When I first arrived, um, it was the era of uh, Nicky and Russ. In fact, um, um, I think Russ actually had left by the time uh, uh, I was there. And then it was Nicky and Graham. Uh, it was Graham Kennedy's start in show business. Graham worked in the record library. And when a young man by the name of Russ went on national service... Nicky looked around for somebody to, to take Russ's place and said, how about the boy in the record library? I think at that stage Graham was delivering records and running messages and Graham came in and was one of the great success stories of all time. It was the year of Bob Horsfall and the Tune Twisters of later on Happy Hammond, uh, John McMahon, of course, who was there uh, well before I was. And then we went into the era that you've just played the jingle, uh, the era of... Um, Don Lund and Alan Lappin and Don Rainsford and Sam Anglesey, the arrival of the Top 40, the Beatles' visit to Melbourne. All of those things really made 3UZ, um, and it was teamwork as much as anything else, and it was also good people uh, and lots of them. But it seemed to me that 3UZ saw the advent of television, took it on and won, where the other stations seemed to mess around, still doing a bit of community singing and still with their their hearts back in the 40s, you uh, said, you know, uh, you started getting very contemporary. I think you're right too, Bruce, because uh, when I arrived there, it was uh, just before the advent of television. Television came in 1956. I think I arrived in 1955. And uh, certainly people were talking about radio being steam radio in those days. What was going to happen? And I can remember the then, the then general manager, Lewis Bennett, talking to the staff about the fact that uh, we had to do something different. We had to be different, and a five-year plan was set. I think we got about six months into the five-year plan um, uh, because there wasn't any need to, to go any further at that particular stage. But what happened, Bruce and Philip, I think, was that there was a recognition that because television uh, could do drama and comedy and quizzes and the rest of it so much better... Um, and live, not so much live sport then, uh, that radio should concentrate on uh, what it could do best. And that was the immediacy of news, the, um, uh, the music side of it. And there were two stations in Australia that really began this revolution, 2UE in Sydney and 3UZ in Melbourne. Bob, well, we're going to jump all over the place here, but I just want to talk about the late 70s and early 80s where you had heavyweights of the calibre of Tony Barber, Don Lane, Bob Rogers and Bert Newton at the station. How did you cope with those big egos? Because at times, I'm sure, you know, there were swords drawn. Oh, it wasn't so much swords drawn, I don't think. It was a matter of um, uh, uh, being able to, to work with those people, and they were just great people. And you have jumped slightly, by the way, um, because there was an era in between those. But let's, you know, let's talk about that. Uh, UZ was going through one of its uh, downs, and I suppose every radio station and every television station um, has a, uh, a period of ups and a period of downs. And John McMahon came up with the idea that, that Bert Newton might be really very good for the radio station. And um, I was enthused about it as well. I forget what position I was in at the station then. And I don't think Bert even knows this to this day. But the then general manager said, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, John McMahon was, uh, was asked to, uh, uh, to speak to Bert uh, on a Sunday night at Channel 9, did so. Then I began a series of meetings with him and Bert came to the station. Uh, I produced his show for about six months. Um, and, of course, Philip, you were one of the producers of the Bert Newton show, too. 
Yes, I was. I had three of the happiest years of my life there, Bob. And they were happy years, weren't they? They really were. And Bert came up with the idea, oh, one of the great thrills, I think, and it really was. Uh, the station was dragging its heels a bit in the ratings at that time. And the very first series of McNair Anderson ratings that came out after Bert started, uh, Bert's program, Bert's time slot, moved from number nothing to number two. And that was just completely fantastic that's amazing that's uh, that's some sort of record as we're jumping around a bit bob let's go back to the early days and uh john mcmahon introducing uh the chief announcer at 3uz in the early or well the mid 50s as it turns out uh, here he is you've met tiny snell dick hemming tom jones john worthy and fred tupper now you should meet our chief announcer bob cornish 26 years of age 10 years of solid experience in all departments of broadcasting in the city and country and one of radio's future greats. There is nothing haphazard about 3UZ announcer's approach to work. At a weekly meeting, all new copy to come into our schedule is tabled, bugs are ironed out, and the sales department report on results of special commercials. Styles of microphone setting are rehearsed and discussed, and these meetings allow an expression of thought on the commercial approach, which in my experience is quite unique. I'd like you to meet some of our air salesmen. You like their voices and their drive. Nice to come home to three users. And they did have drive and great sales ability, didn't they, Bob? You rotted. <laughs> How about the very British voice? Yes, we have general meetings, all of the sales staff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were all a bit um, a bit British, I suppose, in those days, weren't we? Well, I, I must have developed an Australian accent later on. Yeah, you first appeared behind a microphone, and I didn't know this until today, Bob, at the age of nine on 3DB. Yes, I certainly did, and uh, I was lucky enough. I, I was a great fan of radio as a, uh, as a kid, uh, just as so many kids, I suppose, are fans of... Uh, uh, of TV today at that age, and uh, uh, the 3DB children's session was operated by a remarkable lady by the name of Jean Lawson, and I was a real fan, and one night I heard a call for people to come in and ask questions uh, of the experts at the museum, so you couldn't hold me back, I was there, and after I asked my question, Jean Lawson came up and she said, um, you've got a rather nice voice would you like to take part in a serial that uh, that we run on 3db in the children's session called the fake of the ganges well you couldn't hold me back i thought how marvelous two nights a week racing after school and when i found out i got paid for it as well that was just all too much and that then led to uh two other appearances in various abc uh, radio serials um australasian radio productions Oh, I suppose for a period of oh, something like six or seven years until I took my first full-time job in radio. Well, we're not doing this chronologically. I think it's more interesting to, to jump around. I first uh, got to know you at Channel 9 when you used to appear in Graham Kennedy's in Melbourne tonight doing commercials for the drink Revella. Remember those good old days? This mountain drink, you're quite right. I think I probably sent it broke, Philip. But, but it wasn't only IMT, it was the Channel 7 sports show, and uh, you were appearing on Channel 2 even, too, weren't you? Yes, I was doing, in fact, I appeared on Channel 2 um, in 1956, one of the first of the live shows, which was called Camera Club, and then we moved on to uh, other shows. Uh, uh, there was a panel show called What Next? There was a variety show called Saturday Party. Um, so I did a lot of moonlighting uh, on television while I was still with uh, UZ, and I must say, with with UZ's uh, permission uh, to be able to do that, it was a lot of fun. That Ravella commercial, I will never forget one night, Philip, but only you would know what could happen. Um, I was given a, a, a golf club because this was going to be a, a golf setting. So there I am, live in in Melbourne tonight, in the commercial set, swing back the golf club, knock, knock the entire set over, and of course a 30 second commercial became a five minute scream because immediately Graham just used to love that so much. 
you, 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 yeah, sorry. Bob used to dress for the part, I, I think. think you had leather little pants. Austrian shorts. Leather pants. No, and it didn't quite go that far. I think it was a, I think it was just a hat with a feather in. Isn't that unusual? Graham Kennedy, the boy you saw as a record librarian with Nicky, throwing to you, um, his boss, as you were in the old days, uh, doing a commercial. Yeah, but I wasn't his boss when Graham was there. No, but weren't you stage studio uh, chief announcer? No, no oh, um, I think Graham had left by that stage. Mm -hmm. I started off as an announcer, then senior announcer, then chief announcer. And Graham left fairly soon afterwards. It was when television began, and in fact, Nicky was supposed to uh, to take over the program in Melbourne tonight. And Nicky unfortunately died. He died very young, I think at, at about the age of 51 or 52. Uh, an immense tragedy. And uh, then um, other people were looked at for the job of this variety show, and Graham was finally chosen. Apart from the variety show, the morning of his, uh, or the weekend he passed away, what was the, the station's policy then to his program? Were you left at sixes and sevens? Did you have any idea of what to do? Nicky died on a Saturday afternoon. Um, he'd uh, come home from, uh, or his family had been away on holidays, uh, Nancy Lee and the, and, and the boys. And I was on the air on the Saturday afternoon, and I get a telephone call from Nancy Lee at about, oh, I suppose, 5.15 on, on, on the Saturday afternoon. And in a very disturbed fashion, obviously, she said, look, Nicky's just died, and I'm so worried about who I'm going to tell, because at that stage, our general manager had been through a heart attack, and she was very concerned about him. And uh, anyway, uh, the following day, there was a Red Cross appeal, and all of us were absolutely stunned. There just wasn't anybody in the radio station that wasn't mind-boggled about Nicky's sudden death. And the whole of that uh, appeal day, uh, which was incredibly successful from a financial point of view, uh, for, uh, I think it was Red Cross, in fact, I'm sure it was, uh, everything was dedicated to Nick. And then, of course, who was going to take over? What was going to happen? And eventually, as you may remember, uh, Happy Hammond took over. But Nick was a huge loss. Didn't they also have a party time show, Nicky and Graham, on a Saturday night? And, and I think the week that uh, Graham or Nicky died, I think Graham hosted that on his own? Uh, Am I right about that? Frankly, don't remember that. Uh, I know that uh, they finished at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, because, <laughs> talking about community singing... At one o'clock on a Friday afternoon, Tiny Snell's community singing was on. And I think Nick's last words were crossing to the Paran Town Hall uh, for uh, the... Yes, it was the, uh, uh, the Paran community singing. Bob, we have so many nightliners in particular who call in and say, listen, we've never had a survey book uh, passed under our door. Exactly how do radio surveys work? And I thought, as we're speaking to the director of client service of what used to be McNair Anderson. You, Bob Cornish, might explain exactly to us how surveys work. Oh, boy, have I got about an hour? <laughs> Just in your own words, in layman's terms. It's not quite as bad as that, Philip. No, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, a random sample of people is taken, um, and uh, for every survey, and they run for a period of eight weeks, a minimum of uh, 2,200 people receive survey books, they receive survey diaries. And those survey diaries are then uh, left with them for a period of one week. Um, uh, officially, the uh, McNair-Anderson, or now AGB McNair people, place them uh, by knocking on the door once the sample has been chosen. Uh, they fill them in for the week, um, and they're very cooperative. People really enjoy doing uh, radio surveys because they hear so much about them. Uh, then at the end of the eight-week period, uh, all the quarter hours of listening are added up, obviously by a computer, and the ratings come out from there. But they're just far more than uh, quarter hours. Uh, there's cumulative audience and there's average audience and there's share of audience and uh, there's reach and frequency and all sorts of rather technical things that happen uh, from there. But it's a very good system and it's a... It's a system that is as accurate as it possibly could be. Bob, do you fear the day when people meters might replace uh, the AGB McNair surveys? 
No, I don't. In fact, uh, we're working uh, with an American company now on a meter for radio, and I think that eventually, uh, when this metering system is perfected for radio, uh, they certainly will overtake the diary system. And we believe, because of our association with this very high-tech American company, uh, that will be part of that uh, new technology in measuring radio audience. Well, we've traversed many years, Bob Cornish, from serials, community singing, drama, uh, faker McGanges, right up to people meters and, uh, and the technology of the 90s. But radio is still there, still supreme, and thanks for being part of our show tonight. That's more than a pleasure. Philip, Bruce, nice to talk to you again. We've enjoyed it, Bob. <laughs> This is the place, the place on your dial for a listening smile. This is the spot for music that's bright and news that's right. The place is 9.30, the station is 3 you say. So stay right here, you found the right place, 3 you say.